to talk about the changing face of the retirement landscape, we're joined by Mark Futcher, who's a partner at Barnet Waddingham, and by Jonathan Watsley, who's a director of Wealth at Work. Um, Mark, to start us off, tell us about the major changes that pensions freedoms have brought from an employer's point of view. Yeah, I think you know it's it's it was around much more meant much more to employers than lots of people um, envisaged really. Um, lots of people concentrated on pension freedom from the impact it would have on the employees, the members, the man on the street, uh, and we'll come on to, to talk about that, I'm sure. But from the employer perspective, it had a big knock-on effect. We've seen the change from DB pensions to DC pensions, and arguably DC is never a retirement savings vehicle. You know, you, you didn't have to, um, you know, it, it wasn't something that um, members appreciated um, the amount of money they had in. They never appreciated the amount of money they had to put into these things. They weren't saving enough money in it. So it was always struggling to provide a, a pension in, income in retirement at the level that was needed. Um, now with freedom and choice, and you're not compelling people to turn that pot of money into a, a guaranteed income until the day they die, yeah. that's actually brought some real headaches for um, employers as well. Mm -hmm. You've had to remove all of the default retirement age, so these people can't be forced out the door um, at, at a reasonable age. And people, you know, the worry from lots of employers that we talk to is that pension pots are not going to be used so that they can retire, so people in so their people employment can retire at a sensible age. They'd have to stay at work, yeah, as so, it were. So and, employers and you, are having to and you change. Can't, can't remove them, no. uh, even, even though, uh, because they simply haven't got enough money to retire. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so employers are having to change how they're tackling this problem. Um, lots of them are saying, well, actually, look, you know, do we change our overall remuneration strategy? And they're taking a much wider look at, uh, at how they engage their employees, how they recruit, attract, and retain them. Mm. Yeah. Is it, in a sense, easier for employers these days? Because they have to do something, and in a sense, it's proscribed as to what they have to do, Jonathan. Well, I think, I think um, when people are saving, that's right. So with things like auto-enrolment, of course, that has to be offered to, to employees. Um, and so far, take-up has been pretty good at, uh, for, for, for auto-enrolment. I think the, the, the big question now, though, is what happens when they get to retirement? Because, of course, the employer, in theory, doesn't have, need to do any, anything at all. Um, the employer can just turn around to the employee and say, well, you've got a pension pot with us. Where do you want the, the money sent to? Yep. Uh, uh, however, for the reasons that, that Mark's picked up, uh, that actually won't work for a lot of employers because, of course, they need to manage their workforce. If people aren't retiring, and of course, a lot of companies, a lot of companies we work with, they do have, you've got baby boomers, and people, there are this aging workforce. So do you want a workforce that, that where a large proportion of, uh, proportion of people, uh, you know, in their 70s or 80s? Mm -hmm. Probably a lot of businesses don't. Sure. Um, so, <laughs> so, so the question then becomes is, so actually, what are you going to put in place? What plan are you going to have as an employer to try and get people to understand that A, are they saving enough? Yep. Um, B, actually, freedom and choice means it's not just about their pension, it's about other savings they may have that may contribute to income when they go into retirement. So let's now start thinking about a, a, a retirement plan. Mm -hmm. So I think the big, the big thing that's starting to change and is starting to dawn on a lot of employers, and some employers have already put, put, put plans in place, is actually we have the pension for the accumulations phase, the, yep. the saving phase, but actually now we need a plan for the retirement phase. Okay. Um, it, it's usually thought about in terms of risk to an employer and cost to an employer. Mm -hmm. uh, basic risks to an employer, pension schemes? Well, I think the risk is that they, have a, they, they see a very much different shape of their, their, their employment workforce. Okay. You know, they have this ageing population coming through. That's a blocker for young talent to, to come through the ranks. So we are, we are seeing that as an issue. You know, I know lawyers are getting around lots of inquiries about you know, what kind of process should we be building in to, to help you know, yeah. manage these people out of the business, you know, and that's going to be on sort of performance type grounds, which you know, is not a nice way to end some long careers, mm -hmm. potentially. Mm -hmm. um, the other risks are that um, you, know, you, you do need an attractive um, sort of package to recruit yep. and attract and retain these people as and well. Uh, yeah, and you know, auto enrollment has set the benchmarks. Yep. Um, so are people actually going to say, look, you know, people have never really engaged in pensions, particularly DC pensions, have never really understood or appreciated the longer term value of, of pension savings. Do we move and look to a more here and now type benefit package uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and change that? And that's obviously a risk as well because, you know, you see, you know, other, other benefits coming through which probably they're not used to and comfortable to, 
to, to deal with and manage. Jonathan, any evidence to suggest that employers are finding it just too costly, uh, these new pension reforms? Yeah, I think, I think there's a bit of a backdrop here because, of course, what a lot of employers did uh, pre-freedom and choice was that they would they would set up things like annuity panels so they would say right so when you get to retirement the assumption is people will buy an annuity here's a panel that we've selected on your behalf you can go in and you don't have to but you could go and select a, an annuity provider from, from that panel um, so they gave a little bit of help um, uh, when freedom and choice came along of course because the options are now so broad all of a sudden, that, that, that almost sent the, 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 the employers and trustees into a state of flux, thinking, well, well, what can we do? So they then started thinking about, well, actually, could we do something through our pension scheme? Could we offer these flexibilities through our pension scheme? But then they started saying, well, hold on, this is quite costly. All of a sudden, they, they decided there was a lot of risk, particularly for the trustees, because do you really want to be managing the money of members when they're 80? And, and you know what happens when they phone up and say, oh, can I, can I have £5,000 out of my pension? Yep. And as a trustee, you, you go, well, actually, that's your last. Five thousand pounds. Yeah. What? What? So, yeah. and also infrastructure. You know, actually creating the infrastructure to, yeah. to, to deliver that. Yeah. So, for those reasons, a lot of employers looked at that and went, actually, this is this is just actually too difficult because of risk, because of cost, because yeah. of lack of infrastructure. Um, but nevertheless, we do need we do need a plan because we do need to, to to manage the workforce. So, what a lot of them are now looking at is saying, well, actually, in the same way that most of them actually outsource pensions when people are saving, so whether that's the administration or um, or, or e e even outsourcing the the, the the pension itself, is actually saying, well, actually, we should now go and find providers that can give us an, a holistic service to help manage the workforce as they retire but actually that individuals can keep as they go through retirement because as an employer do we really care what happens to them when they're 70 or 80 well high level we might but actually a detailed level we don't want to be spending money on sure. it um, but nevertheless that that issue needs needs to be addressed okay what about from an employee's point of view then I, I, I remember actually interviewing a pensions minister 15 years ago when he told me we were living through the golden age of retirement at that time and since then we've had this revolution all a good thing from an employee's point of view well i think i think employees individuals look at freedom and choice generically as a good thing um because I mean, as some, someone said to me a, 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 a few weeks ago, well, freedom and choice are pretty positive words, aren't they? If you say to someone you can have freedom and choice, what's not to like? So, sure. so, so I think the whole idea of flexibility people like, and of course, in the old world, most people ended up buying annuities. We know they were not a great deal for people. So, so again, high level, mm -hmm. I think people like it and they like the, the, they like the flexibility, they like the fact that they can keep hold of their money and they don't have to pay it away to an insurance company. And of course there are benefits of that in terms of inheritance, tax planning and, and, and other things. Um, but the problem with it is, is that even though that flexibility is good, what we do know is that people find it very hard to make decisions and make, and make correct decisions. And when you think that people might have a number of pensions, a mix of DB and DC pensions, they might have ISAs, they might have shares through the company they work for, they might have other savings. All of that really needs to be taken into the mix, not least, so you don't pay too much tax, yep. so therefore you get more income when you are in retirement. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they need help with that, and that's the issue. And of course, one of the things we've seen um, is scams, you know, the scamming. So, so all of a sudden, the scammers know that individuals can get hold of this money, yeah. um, and it's a, it's a reasonable chunk of money. You know, even for those that have got relatively small pots, it's still mm -hmm. a reasonable chunk of money. And so the, the, the flexibility is, is light. The issue is, is actually how do you guide and educate people through a process so they do the right thing and they optimize their income in retirement. Mm -hmm. Too many options for people? Well, yeah, I, I, I think so, yes. Um, I think the first point I was going to make is that we had automatic enrolment and that was brought on the basis that the public cannot be trusted to, to take decisions in their, in their, in their long-term interest. And with freedom and choice, you've completely flipped that round and you said, you know, you, you can be trusted now and you can be trusted at the point where you've got the most money to lose potentially. Mm. You know, auto enrolment, you haven't saved anything mm. yet. Um, so I think, you know, th th there was always that sort of oddity there. Um, having said that, the choices that we had before were pretty, pretty limited and pretty broken. It was, you know, an annuity on one end of the spectrum where you took no risk, you had no flexibility, but you, you, you paid for that insurance against you living too long. And then right on the other end of the spectrum, you had drawdown where you accepted all of those risks. There was no real midway, midway grounds. 
And obviously now what we've done is we've kind of changed that model into a, into a triangle almost with you can have it all as cash as deferred option. Yeah. And actually if you think about taking any of those options in isolation, they're all extreme options and they're all not covering one of the major risks that exist in retirement. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, people are going to be better off taking a combination of those three solutions, i.e. somewhere inside that, that triangle. And as Jonathan alluded to, it's incredibly complicated. You know, the need to, to sit down with someone who understands this, understand the evolving market, understand that actually times are going to change, not just from the products and the services on offer in the market, but also the individual needs, wants and wishes are gonna change very, very dramatically from age 65 right through from you know, 75, 85 until the, the, until the point of death. We've got other stuff interacting with that long-term care. We're still not quite sure how that's all going to react, but actually it might come to a point where you want to get rid of all your money. Yeah. I, I like this idea of e extremes uh, uh, as such. Uh, is, there any, is there much evidence that people have gone the, the Lamborghini route? Um, no. I mean, I, I think if you, if you look at all the stats that are out there from the ABI, the FCA, and, and all these different bodies, there was always going to be a run to cash yeah. when this first came in. People were excited that they could get their hands on money. You actually looked at the underlying reasons why people took that money. It was relatively small amounts of money, wasn't it? Sort of yeah. five, six, seven thousand yeah. pounds, and they were using it to pay off debt. If you're paying debt at 25, 26, you know, even, even higher percentage levels than that, yeah, it probably makes very, very good sense. This is not going to provide you with a stable income in retirement to use that pot. We have now seen a steadying of that run to cash people using this to secure incomes, but DC pots are still very, very low level, mm. you know, 30, 40,000 pounds. Yeah. Arguably, it's not the bulk of the income that they're gonna get. Okay. The state pension is taking up a lot of that anyway as well. Oh, right. yeah. um, the, the concept that people now should not think about the word retirement, there's almost a, you know, pensions, ooh, you, know, you yeah, talked yeah. about words earlier, yeah. ooh, no, 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 no. Um, have employees actually embraced that? Do you believe there's evidence to suggest that they can cope with that change in attitude to finishing full-time, long-term work? Yeah, I think... I think it's starting to change. So I think I think part of the part of the issue is is just one of history, really. Is that you know you had a pensions department in a yep. company, and the pensions department did pensions. Yep. Um, whereas now we're in a world where actually, when you start to go into retirement, even though that might be a, a phased retirement, you know you may still be working part time or whatever. But actually now it's about um, income replacement and actually where you're going to generate that income from, and that income may or may not come from a pension. Mm. It may come from a, may come from a range of things. Right. In yeah. fact, yeah. in fact. Um, when you first retire, you may generate income from assets that you get taxed on, as opposed to ones you don't get taxed on, like like a pension. So, so, so all of a sudden, there is this real kind of change, uh, structural change that people need to understand, which is it's how you optimise income in retirement and how you replace the income you had when you were working with income in retirement. And I think a lot of employers and trustees are beginning to, to understand that now. And we've certainly seen the first two or three large organizations that have completely taken that on board and have actually put in solutions which are, which are holistic in nature. Right. So it's all, around, it's all about making sure those people that are in the lead up to retirement and at the point of retirement, they actually understand those options and they understand that whilst pension may be a key part of it, it's not the whole story. What sorts of questions are employees asking their employers now? I think that's important. I think employers are pretty much put front and centre uh, on these issues. You know, a lot of the emphasis was placed on with automatic enrolment. They think, well, actually, you know, you, my employer, put me into this. You've got to help me all the way through it. Mm. And that's certainly what we're seeing. Employees are expecting much more from their employers in terms of help and guidance. I suppose, you know, employers are very, very concerned um, about... Um, what they're putting in at the moment, they probably know that's not enough, they know they need to save, but actually debt in the UK is a massive, massive issue as well. And I don't think we can start saving, uh, solving the savings problem um, without talking about that sort of debt management place as well. So there's, there's lots of I interesting initiative ideas coming up to help that space. So it, it, employees just need more help and more guidance with general financial well-being, I suppose. But particularly when it so comes up... instead of a pensions department, it should be a... 
a financial well-being yeah, financial department. Well-being. Yeah, mm-hmm. Absolutely right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it's a it's a buzzword that's you know sort of creeping up in the industry. Um, but financial well-being, I think, you know, you, you see your pensions as your later life savings vehicles. You've got your sort of short to medium terms. You've got the introduction of this Lisa or Lisa coming in. Yeah. If we want to make it gender neutral. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then we've got the short short term savings, also debt management piece. That that takes up your financial well-being. And as Jonathan says, it needs to incorporate those those wider things, equity release. Um, or, or stuff like that. That's going to be an area to... As you suggest, thinking about tax, yeah. which many yeah. people, if you're on PAYE, I yeah. know yeah. from experience, you don't even think about it. You just look at what's left at the end of yeah. people taking the deductions, yeah. as yeah. it was. So yeah. A really interesting point of, uh, uh, that you've made there. You mentioned a holistic solution. Develop that for me a little more, because from the <laughs> what we at Asset TV mm. could, would call the retail side of yeah. things rather than the yeah. institutional side of things, the term holistic solution for financial advisors has been around, to mm. my certain knowledge, for yeah. five years at yeah. least, um, encompassing the whole of the well-being of a, of a client. From a pensions point of view, what do you mean by holistic solution? So what we're, what we're really talking about here is, is that all things need to be considered. So all savings need to be considered. So not just the pension, the ISAs, the share schemes, etc. But it's also the process that, that people go through. So that it, it's part of that process of people need to be educated. So people need to understand what the options are that they have, um, because otherwise they're relying on you know the last headline they they, they, they read in the the, the the daily newspaper. So it's important that they they actually understand what these options are and they understand the implications uh, of, of those options. So when Mark was saying earlier, you know there was this run to cash when the new rules came in, um, a lot of people did not appreciate that. Of course, that's it's it's it's, it's treated as income. Yep. So so it will be taxed. Okay, yeah, twenty five percent tax free. But after that, mm-hmm. it will be taxed. Mm-hmm. And if you've had earnings that year, of course, you, you, you know you could even be yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you know you could even be jumping a tax rate. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So people need to understand what the options are, but also generically what the implications are of those options. Um, increasingly, they will need regulated advice because, of course, as soon as you understand what those options are, what people say automatically is, OK, well, let me tell you about my situation. Mm-hmm. And, of course, everybody's individual situation is slightly different. Yeah. So, so then you get down to that very personalised level of, OK, what's right for me then, given my situation? And then the final piece of that holistic picture is the ability to implement whatever is the right solution. So we know now that, that uh, well, it goes back to Mark's, Mark's triangle, you know, it will not be, or probably won't be, in most cases, 100% into annuity, mm. but it might be a mix of other things around, around that triangle. So actually, what is the right mix for you? And actually, where do you sit on that triangle? And actually, where you sit on that triangle day one, when you first retire, may not necessarily be where you need to sit on that triangle day two or when you're 70 or 80. And so therefore you get into this ongoing service element because it's not a, with annuity, it was a single, effectively a single decision and you're done literally to the day you die. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not the case. So when we talk about holistic, it's that whole process. Regulated, unregulated advice. We, we, this surely the element of consumer protection, which I know is worrying uh, the government at the moment. I mean, I'd agree. We see too many people taking decisions in isolation, and they, they need to understand that they need to look at these bits uh, sort of more holistically. Um, just going back to that point, I think it's almost the role of the employer to educate their employees on the need to seek good advice on these issues. Mm-hmm. And actually, you know, you can easily um, out, you know, the benefits of taking advice easily outweigh the cost of it. In terms of regulated, non-regulated, this has been rumbling on for a long, long time. You know, what can be done by a computer, by a robot, by a machine, what needs to be done by, by, a, by a human. And actually, you know, quite a few of these decisions um, you know, are sort of decision tree type, type decisions, yes. but it needs someone to be able to stitch that all together and understand that, that much, much wider concept. And you know, I, I certainly think that you know, if we are going to engage the masses, um, we haven't got enough qualified advisors in the UK. We need to simplify yeah. this process. Yeah. So we do need to automate a lot of it. And there are a lot of service type models that are coming out and saying, look, you know, you as an individual need to do a lot of this work, pump a lot of this information into the computer and the machine. So when an advisor comes along, you know, if you only get half an hour with them an hour, they already have all these facts facts to hand. Okay. You know, the advisor can shortcut a lot of those routes if they have the knowledge and the information to hand. Some people may say that the pensions industry has been not very diligent at providing simple products yeah. out there. I, I, 
it's not a simple problem to solve though, uh, it would, would be mine. You know, annuity is a relatively simple product. It's, it's been tarnished, it's got a really, really bad reputation. But if you ask people, um, do you want annuity? 98% of people will say no. Do you want a guaranteed secure income until the day you die? Most people will say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so there is a terminology issue here um, that we need to get round as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, the industry probably hasn't done, done well. Do you know product? Well, um, I would argue there's too many products already because I think one of the problems is is that you know there's an element of sort of lazy thinking in, in saying, right, so people used to buy this product called annuity. Nobody likes that anymore. Um, so let's just try and find a, a new product that people will like. Whereas actually what the regulation does is actually goes much more to a service model than a product model. So because again, it needs to take account of, of all the assets you hold or the savings you hold, it needs to take account of tax, then it's for most people, a single product probably will not give a solution. So what it needs is, is to have your savings managed at a service level. Um, you, know, you avoid things like exit penalties and, and, and transaction charges. So it's just managed as a whole. And of course, those services are coming into place now. So, so I think that, that, that if you like, the, the, the leading edge thinking now is very much, this is not about product anymore. This is about a service provision that's going to last you for the next 25, perhaps 30 years. One thing I realised is that this does not stand, stand still. This no. landscape is constantly yeah. changing. Uh, from your point of view, is there anything we should watch out for? Or is there anything we should be doing now in order to prepare for the changes that are coming? As you say, it's going to evolve constantly. I think it's interesting that the UK have moved to a system of greater flexibility, greater freedom and choice, and most of the other countries around the, the world that have had that flexible freedom and choice style system are moving back the other way, i.e. greater, uh, greater security um, on income in retirement. So I think that's one to look out for. You know, we were a big fan of freedom and choice, but once you've secured a baseline of income, and actually with the state pension only securing £8,000 of income broadly, you know, you need to top that up probably to around 13 and a half, 14, 14,000 pounds to keep yourself off the breadline. That in itself, it still needs a very, very large pot. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm not sure if we are stuck um, on, on complete freedom and choice or whether we might move back. Jonathan, final word from you. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the other things that's coming into play is, is DB schemes. So there's, a, there's, a, there's been a lot in the press recently about all the deficits in DB schemes. Um, so I think that we're likely to see more regulation regulatory change there as well because there is there is a risk of more of those schemes um, uh, actually going into the, 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 the pension protection fund where people will end up with less better so that raises the whole issue around transfers and I know the FCA are looking at that so I think that's going to be a big area to look at and, and accounting practices yeah is, yeah, is, yeah, is, is yeah it not yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we've had this discussion yeah. before yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> good uh, any more to add to that or is it will it wait for another time for you both to come back again and discuss it further very happy to come back yes but um, yeah <laughs> on, on yeah. that note we'll leave it thank you very much indeed Mark thank you and Jonathan thank you